Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. When I was in university, all I wanted to be was like Christopher De Rosario. Chris was the creative director of an advertising agency. It was called Trakaya Gray. And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be a creative director of an advertising agency. And then somewhere along the way, I decided, no, no, no. I want to be a cartoonist like Bill Watterson, the creator of the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. But even that dream went into a kind of deep freeze, and then I transitioned to wanting to be a writer. And I ran into a book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. It was my tipping point in a way. I loved the way Gladwell wrote, and for the longest time, I wanted to know how he came up with so many cool stories. His research was so exhaustive, and being like Gladwell, that was one of my big priorities in life. Then, like everything in life, you move on, and life pulls you in its own current. Even so, I watched a series recently. It was made by Masterclass.com, and it talked about Gladwell on writing. And to me, Gladwell has always been a bit of an iconoclast, so I like that kind of thing in people. And I expected to learn a lot of interesting stuff, and I wasn't disappointed. And here in this series, I would like to share with you Six of the things that jumped off the screen, so much so that I made a note of them. I even drew some cartoons so that I could have a quick reference later on. But we're not going to cover six points in this episode. That would be too much. We're just going to cover two of them. The first one being candy versus the main meal. What does this mean? We'll figure it out as we go through the podcast. And the second one, which is very interesting, which is how to gauge reader interest with conversation. So let's start out with the first one, which is candy versus the main meal. In 2008, I switched to the Mac after almost 15 years of being on the PC. When people asked me why, I would tell them the story of my presentation. So I'd been doing a lot of presentation. I'd been doing a series of presentations for the clients of a radio station. Now, I'm like a helicopter mom when it comes to my presentations. I hover. I don't want anyone to touch my presentation before I get on stage. But on this occasion, they wanted the slides in advance. To make sure that nothing went wrong, I arrived a whole hour before the event. I tested the slides. And then, when I'm testing the slides... I look up and everything is different. Who's changed my slides? I asked the technician in charge. We didn't change anything, he said. All we did was we loaded your presentation through the Mac software and it's called Keynote. When I looked closer, I realized I was looking in admiration of the slides. I wasn't looking in frustration, I was looking in admiration. And I thought if all they did was run a PowerPoint through Keynote, and it improves so much, then I have to look at the Mac. I have to look at what this whole Mac thing is all about. This is somewhat what Malcolm Gladwell calls candy. And candy is the difference between the meal and the treat. He says that corresponds to the way people talk about things, how they think about things. So when people talk about things, they tend to strip it down to something smaller, something enjoyable, something even tweetable. And this is because of how we think. When we think about something, it could be very complex. It could have several parts. It may or may not be contradictory. Or the parts might be remarkably difficult to explain. So for instance, you know, I talk about talent. That's very complex to explain. And 
you don't want to give people so much stuff. The things that you talk about are the things that you can talk about, the things that are easy to remember, the things that are easy to get across. And usually they're short, they're tweetable, which is similar to the story of the migration on the Mac. I didn't want to move to the Mac. I had a whole suite of programs on the PC. I had the very costly Adobe software. I had painting software like Painter. These were all purchased for the PC. Moving to the Mac would mean that I would have to ditch all of that software. I would have to buy newer versions all over again. Plus, there were programs like Corel Draw at the time, which worked solely on the PC. I don't remember, but that's what I that that was what I thought. Well, it's only going to work on the PC. Now, to have to make all of these changes were extremely frustrating. Plus, I had to convince Renuka that moving from whatever she was doing on the PC to the Mac was a good thing. And all of this transition is a very complex explanation. So when I tell the story of my transition from the PC to the Mac, I don't go into all of this detail. I just strip it down. I strip it down to that one presentation which changed my mind and got me to the Mac. So I'm not expressing the piece. I'm then getting it down to the smallest, most interesting story. In effect, I'm giving you the candy version. And you can take this version, and if you were to tell the story to somebody else, you could tell it very simply. The candy version is a snippet, but it's no ordinary snippet. It's a way for the writer to give you something to talk about. That's you, the reader. It's You can talk about it. You can think about it. The whole book, the whole report, the whole thesis that you've written, that's very dense stuff. And the candy is a story. It's an article. It's a fun little thing that enables you to pass on that message. So when you look at the brain audit, for instance, you'll see loads of candy. Let's take an example. Let's say you ran into a colleague today and you wanted to talk about the brain audit. Now, to get the colleague to read the back of the book or even the introduction would be too much. But if you have candy, it allows you to talk about the seven red bag story. You're not dragging out all the words from 180 pages of the book. Instead, what you're doing is telling a short three to four minute story. Instantly, you have the floor. Instantly, you have the attention but you have also very neatly communicated something. Every book doesn't have to have a main meal and candy, but candy is nice. The candy is a tool for engagement. It helps people to sell the idea to their friends or to talk about what they've consumed. And going back to the brain audit, there is a story about dog poo, and everybody remembers that dog poo story. Now, that is a story that's candy. It's a little nugget, a little snippet. And what it helps is it helps the person, whoever is communicating it to somebody else, to explain the concept of the brain audit in a few seconds. So let's take a second example. If you were to watch the pricing video, and this is on YouTube, it's called Yes, Yes, Pricing, and it's psychotactic. So just look that up and you will find that there is a long presentation on pricing, how you can increase your prices by 10 to 15%. But there, in the middle of it all, is a coffee and a muffin. There's this little snippet about coffees and muffins and how it all affects pricing. And when you're talking to a friend and you're trying to convince her to raise her prices, there's no way on earth you're going to explain the entire yes, yes pricing video. Instead, you're more than likely to reach for the muffin and the coffee story. And this got me thinking because I like structure. So I go, well, does every chapter of the book need candy? Gladwell doesn't go into the details, but I found it fascinating that every chapter or every section could have some kind of candy. Logically, almost every good analogy in your book, in your presentation, wherever you are, that is candy. Analogies, case studies, examples, even footnotes, that's all candy. And to get this act right, we can't just think of books as Gladwell does. 
We have to think of other things like podcasts or webinars. Not the yucky sales pitch kind of webinars, but instructional webinars. We could even create our own candy version. For instance, at the landing page workshop, which I've now called the sales page workshop because it caused too much confusion. But anyway, at the landing page workshop, it seemed like a good idea to create some postcards. Now, these postcards would encapsulate the entire workshop into a single package, a single page. So yes, there are going to be notes. Yes, there's going to be video. Yes, there's going to be the three day workshop, but the postcard, that's a bit of candy. That's something that can be transferred very quickly from one person to the other. They can show their friends and go, this is the part you're missing. And then you can go from there. So it's this little bit, and it's probably instructional. It's probably very inventive. And this is the frustration of it all, because in this episode, Gladwell doesn't go into this whole candy thing in great depth, and yet it is interesting. It is interesting for you to say, what can I put there in a footnote that is instantly transferable from one person to the other? And that's what I've been thinking about. First of all, how do I understand this candy bit a little more? Because obviously there is more to it. But secondly, how can I put this everywhere? It's an incomplete story. It doesn't matter. That's the first thing I learned from Malcolm Gladwell. The second thing, which is very interesting because most people struggle with this, is how to test your story. How to test that story idea quickly and efficiently. Let's find out in the second part of this podcast. About two years ago, my friend Luca and I were up late at night. We were drinking a bit of Lagavulin. As the whiskey drained itself out of the glass, the topic veered to talent. Since at least 2008, I have been obsessed with this concept of talent. I've been threatening to write a book, even three books on talent. But on this particular night, I was, for no particular reason, trying to boil the concept of talent to an equation. From that moment on, I have had this equation chat with people I meet, discuss it on the forum at 5000 BC, and finally, in Singapore, I presented this to an audience. Now, this audience wasn't there to learn about talent. Instead, they were there for this sales page workshop. But I found it pertinent to start day three with the concept of the talent equation. And when I finished that piece, my wife Ranuka came up to me and she said, that's it. I've heard you talk about talent many, many times before, but for the first time, I've heard you explain the concept in a way that's easy to understand, it's easy to implement. Finally, it seemed like I had gotten to the core of the story. And it had come through all of this testing, throwing it out to people and seeing their reaction and then finally coming to this one piece that worked. And Gladwell talks about how he tests his stories as well. Often at the outset of developing a story, he'll tell it over and over and over again to different people. You know what he's looking for, right? He's gauging interest. Now, if you are telling a story, it means that it's interesting to you. It is always interesting to you. That's why you tell the story. But do others find it interesting as well? Which part is interesting to the listener? When do they tune out? More importantly, when do they change the subject? This is very important. When do they change the subject? And if they're interested, then at what point do they jump in with questions or objections? And what do they say next once you've finished with your story or your concept? And the reason why all of these questions are so very important is due to the fact that Gladwell and you should be testing the waters. So what Gladwell does is he sees the person in front of him and he sees that person as a stand-in for his eventual audience, his eventual readership. However, at all times, he's trying not just to get that feedback, but to get very honest feedback. And that is very hard to do. The reason why we don't get that feedback is because we're busy, technically, but it's also a form of laziness. And laziness rarely helps in such matters. So what is lazy? Lazy. 
Laziness in this context is texting someone saying, hey, what do you think of this idea? Or sending an email. Now, there are situations where you're in Auckland, for instance, and the other person is in Leiden or in Singapore. But even so, a face-to-face -face conversation matters. Gladwell prefers the direct in-your-face feedback because it brings out that directness. There's a raw honesty when you're right next to the person rather than when you're separated by technology. Even reading a draft of a chapter or a book, it doesn't elicit the same level of honesty. And once again, we've done this draft reading before, haven't we? We're usually concerned about someone else's feelings. So someone sends you a draft and says, please read it for me. Tell me how it is. How? And you go, oh, what am I going to say? I, I, I don't feel like telling them that it's rubbish. But you put that same person in front of you and you ask them about an idea and they go, oh, that sounds stupid. So immediately what you're getting is this feedback. Or they go, wow, this is amazing. I've never heard it explained this way before. Or the way you tell the story, this part is really interesting. Or they have objections. This kind of banter, as it were, doesn't happen on email. It's much more clunky. It's much more harder to achieve. And what you have to do is, okay, let's go out for a walk. Let me tell you this story. But you don't even have to say, let me tell you the story. That's why we're going for a walk. But essentially, that's the laziness that we have to overcome. We have to get someone in front of us, someone who you can ask their opinion and you can get their response. Comedians know this factor of instant response. They know it to be true. Take, for instance, some clips from The Daily Show with host Trevor Noah. The show goes on for an ad break, and then... That, uh, that, that, that guy out of France was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Just, there were so many things happening that I'd struggle. First of all, I don't know how he's pulling himself up every single time. I also don't get how weak the neighbor is. <laughs> Because the neighbor's holding the kid. And the kid is like the hero of the story. That kid's holding on. Like the kid is just like hanging there. You're like, what kind of a kid is like, the kid is just hanging on. And the neighbor is like, ah, oh, I cannot save you. Because uh. you realize the migrant, like the guy climbs up, I don't know if he's like five or seven floors, pulling himself up and then pulls the child, with one hand, by the way, pulls the child up. But then the guy who's holding him already is just like, yeah, I cannot do anything. It's almost like, I almost, I almost am suspicious that the guy who was like helping the neighbor, you find like he doesn't like that kid. And then the kid was over the edge and he was like, oh no, look, Marie. It is the little boy from next door who is always waking us up at 4 a.m. What has happened? Ah, he has fallen over the balcony. Somebody should save him. Should, are you going to save him? I guess so. Come on, little boy, ah, I'm saving you. Uh, you are so heavy, I cannot lift you. It looks like you are going to fall and then I'm going to sleep in every morning. Oh no, what are we going to wait? What is that man doing? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, you saved the kid, well done. Oh. <laughs> it's just like a wild, like, oh man. So this is a clip from The Daily Show, and they're called In Between Scenes, which of course means in between when they're having the ad break. And these clips were never seen before, so Noah could then take these laughs and use them for stand-up comedy, which he does quite often in the future. Test it, and then use it somewhere else. That's what you're really doing. You're throwing something out there to a live audience. They don't have time to analyze it. They laugh or they react to it in a way that is natural. This randomness in telling a story is what gets you great feedback. It feels like a conversation. It doesn't feel like an audit. And when you're just riffing in the wind, there's a lot less at stake. So in effect, what Gladwell is saying is lower the bar, make it easy for them. Just for good measure, Gladwell will pick friends that he bores to death. So he chooses people who he knows they aren't going to be awed by his status as best-selling author. They will cut him down if his story is not good. This is why he goes back repeatedly with a different angle to the same story.
And I had a similar problem with the concept of the talent equation. Since 2008, I've been trying to get this idea across that inborn talent, if it exists, is pretty inconsequential. That if you wanted to learn to draw or wanted to cook or dance, you could do so in an incredibly short span of time. So well, in fact, that people would think that you've been practicing it for years or that you were born with it. Anyway, it wasn't hard to find people who would say things like, you're so talented, I could never be like that. They look at my cartoons, and at least 50% of the people will say just that. You're so talented, I could never be like that. Now, this is like a red rag in my face, because then I'd get into this two-hour-long conversation. I call it conversation, but it's more one-sided. And at the end of two hours, they'd either stick to their point, or they'd agree with my point of view. The question is, how do I get this idea across in a shorter amount of time? How do I make it more elegant? The only way to get that story across to that point of elegance was to keep pushing it back, push it back in different forms over and over again. And when I say forms, what I mean is I try and get the same idea across in different ways, using different examples, different approaches, and then I see which one is more palatable to the audience. Be aware that you're not watering down your concept. You're not changing it that much. What you're doing is you're approaching the idea from a different road, from a different perspective, and then it's time to test it out. It's time to test it out with an audience, just like Gladwell does. And this is where we run into some trouble because we think, well, Gladwell is in New York. He is a staff writer at the New Yorker. He is already in a big city. That's a big advantage. And, you know, we don't have access to other writers. We don't have access to people like that in world-class magazines. It's extremely rare to run in such a situation. There are interesting people everywhere, no matter whether you're in Auckland or Cape Town or Liverpool or Dunedin, but it's not easy to find such people. It's not easy to get their attention, which is often where a forum helps tremendously. So when I get an idea, I want to test it. I might put it in Facebook, but Facebook and even Facebook groups, they don't have depth. The format is clunky because it's more suited to information that's on the move rather than an archivable discussion. And so in 5000 BC, the forum is where I put my ideas forward. And this article, for instance, is first being written in 5000 BC in the forum, at which point the feedback comes in pretty rapidly. People like it, they have objections, they read something, they drive you to another reference. And the in-person chat, which is what Gladwell is recommending, is the best of all. There's no doubt about it. Because people push back, you know, when you're talking to them. And those ideas are the best of all. But if you can't have that, then you take second best. I would like to say that the forum is the best. And you have great discussions on a forum. But the best is definitely face-to-face. -face because you can see that instant reaction. But there's one more thing that Gladwell says. And he urges you and me to pay attention. To pay attention to the specific phrase as well. The moment when you write something or you say something that's mildly interesting to the other person, they want to jump in. They want to be part of that ongoing conversation. They will utter something like, oh, that reminds me of, and then they will go off on a tangent. Listen. Listen and listen. Don't pull back to your own megaphone because that person is giving you a lead into another world that you're not aware of. This world possibly leads to a dead end, but there is often a chance that it will significantly enhance the depth and the clarity of your story. And conversation goes like this. For instance, you may say to your partner, I didn't sleep very well last night, and they say something about their sleep, and then you go down possibly what disrupted your sleep, and then you get this chatter. And at some point, that conversation might get to a point where you realized that all you needed to do was to get the white noise app so that you could sleep a whole lot better. When you have a story, you have to do a lot more listening. 
yes, it's your point of view, but it's a conversation. It's a specific type of discussion. It's one where you're testing, but you're also getting their version of what they hear, what they know, and most importantly, the resources and the connections that they have. Asking someone, what does the story remind you of? That's a great way to get a conversation going. Telling a story isn't difficult, but it might involve some bit of lagavulin, it might involve some conversation, or it might be just a walk that you take with friends or a visit to a cafe. But even if you can't go out, find yourself a forum, and there you can have your ideas challenged consistently. You can get objections, you can get other resources. And as far as possible, do it casually. Don't make it this big, oh, this is my book project. This is a simple question that you have. Make it casual because there's a high chance of the other person responding quickly and without too much fear of offense. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. But what did we cover in this episode? Two things. The first thing is candy. And what is candy? Candy are these little snippets. And if you don't want to go into this whole world of candy, think of it as footnotes. What can you put in just a little bit that's interesting in the footnote? And that footnote then helps to explain the bigger picture, the more complex picture, if needed. And when you have that in your book, in your podcast, in your webinar, in whatever you're communicating with, what it does is enable people to pass on the message. And it becomes a very important part for you as a writer, as a reader, as a communicator, because you want your message to be passed on. And that's what Gladwell talked about right at the start. Have your candy, and that points to the main meal. And the second thing we do is that we fail to test our idea casually in a chat, in a conversation, in this very casual atmosphere. I mean, you could technically do this through some kind of chat medium like WhatsApp or Messenger or whatever. But having this casual conversation allows the other person to refute, to be who they are instead of, hey, here's my book. Can you give me feedback on the book? Well, that's much harder to do. Or here's the chapter and can you give me feedback? An idea should be this conversation that you're having with someone. A forum is remarkably good. Find the right forum though. You can get into forums where all they're trying to do is self-promote, and that doesn't work. What I tend to do is I go out every morning for a walk with Renuka, and I will put forward a story and she'll go now. And, or she will say something. And so we have this kind of casual conversation, but I also have conversation with friends over Messenger, I also have conversation through Zoom. I will just say, hey, I want to talk to you about this stuff. And then we'll talk about other things. And then I'll bring up this story. And then I'll watch what they're doing. And you can do this through web conference. You know, this is the beauty of it. Yes, I know Gladwell sits in New York. And you don't live in New York. Possibly you do, but maybe you don't. But you can do this through Zoom. You can do this through so many methods today. And I know I said technology can be a nutter, but technology can also be a boon. So try it out, and that's how you go about it. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. What is the one thing that you can take today? The one thing that you can do today is take a walk and be generous. Go and buy your friend a cup of coffee. This generosity thing is amazing. I, I see people, they're splitting everything these days. It's like, oh, well, I've had my coffee, and you're paying for your coffee, and I'm paying for my lunch, and you're paying for... Come on, be generous. Go out there, take a friend. Yes, it's for your own purposes, but, and if nothing comes of it, you've been generous and you've taken a walk and it doesn't take much and you don't have to be a Scrooge. Stop being a Scrooge and start taking walks. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. So what's happening in 5000 BC and Psychotactics Land? Well, I haven't updated you since we got back from our trip, but we started out in Singapore and that was a very cool workshop. It was very cool because we had a very small number of people and they got to know each other extremely well. 
We used to have these huge workshops. Now, we are saying huge workshops because there were 35 people in a room. For most people, 35 people in a room, that's a very small workshop. They're like, I want 150, I want 250. You know, they look at these 10,000 people seminars and they go, I want something like that. And for us, 35 was, well, huge. But then one year we had a workshop in Nashville and then we had it in Amsterdam. It was very close to Christmas and people tend to travel in that season. So they're not keen to do this extra travel to do a workshop. Interestingly, we had only 15 people at that workshop. And it was one of the best workshops that we had. And these were consecutive workshops. So it was very interesting. And since then, our goal has been to have 15 people. But, well, we have 16 because it then pairs up people really nicely. And so 16 people is where we are at right now. At Singapore, we didn't even get 16 people. We got eight. And it created this dynamic that was fascinating. So this was rented space and there wasn't this coffee and tea in the room itself. So every time for a break, we had to stand up, go downstairs, cross the building, go across to some other place. And so this was this big pilgrimage. Every time we had tea or coffee and the same thing for lunch. And you would say, well, what about the workshop? Well, the workshops that we have at Psychotactics are always with this huge amount of breathing space because people need to assimilate the information. They need to understand how to use it. But more importantly, they also have to get used to the people in the room. They have to get used to the trainer. They have to get used to the concepts. And so we have this space. We were going to have a two-day workshop in Singapore. And I said, no, we, we need three whole days, even though the content is only for half a day, but we spend two and a half days working on that stuff. And that gives us that breathing space. And this is the reason why we got all our flights a bit wrong and we landed the night before the workshop. Never happens. Usually we're there three, four days, sometimes a week in advance, but we were there the previous night and next morning we had the workshop. So we had a blast in Singapore. It was a small group that was really helpful. And then we went to the 16, that number that we had allocated the last time. And that was in Belgium. Big room, big group. And you realize what a workshop really is when you have 16 people, because I literally struggled to get 30 seconds of the day to myself. From the time I woke up right until 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, I would get people asking me questions and stuff like I would literally have to say, okay, uh, I'm going to take a one-minute coffee break. And, you know, it sounds horrific to some people, and I understand where you're coming from. But for me, I am this extrovert, and I enjoy people, and I enjoy answering questions, and I enjoy solving problems. And so I just needed that one minute coffee break. That's all the introvert time that I need. And then I'm back into it. So that's kind of what we did with Brussels and with Singapore. And we made some great friends. And if you come to a psychotactics workshop and you have a chance, there's one in Houston. There are only three seats left at the point of this recording. So if you think, well, I want to experience this workshop, and want to learn how to conduct workshops like this, then here's your opportunity. Go to psychotactics.com slash landing pages and you will find that information. And the next time, I'll probably tell you a bit about the Italy trip and stuff. But for now, let's close this and I'll say thanks for listening to the podcast and bye for now. And yes, we'll see you in 5000 BC. I always say that. That's the place where introverts are. And there's me, the big extrovert, all the time answering questions. Okay, bye-bye. Still listening? Okay, that was Renuka calling me to go for a coffee. But anyway, I'll tell you the story. At our workshops, what we tend to do is we ask people to bring a little 
something from their hometown. Most of them bring some kind of chocolate or sweet, so salty or sweet or whatever, something edible from their hometown. And the weirdest one that we had was a salmon. Someone brought a salmon. And you know how hotels and stuff, they go nuts over something like that, which can degrade and, and cause bacterial infection and stuff like that. And so that was one of the weirdest things. But Simon Lamy came close to it. He brought some space food, stuff that people eat in space. And yes, I would say first salmon, Simon, you get the second place. So that's, there's someone waiting for a third place there. But this is a bit of candy. So what I'm telling you here is about the workshop, but telling it to you in an interesting way, like a snippet as a footnote. And that's what still listening is all about in a way. It's a little footnote that gives you an insight into the psychotactics world. So now I'll say bye for now, because otherwise I'll get that call again. I'm off for a coffee. You have a great day too. And buy someone else a coffee and take a walk. No Scrooge anymore. Bye bye.